Hello, my name is Adil Wally. I'm the CEO of Crowd Interactive, and today I'm going to give a talk on the Agile Iteration. This is a great topic because the iteration is one of the most misunderstood components of Agile development. And when implemented incorrectly, it can really hurt a team. And when implemented well, it can strengthen a team, and not only that, it can increase the velocity of that team and sort of be the cornerstone of their Agile implementation. So let's dive right in and first understand what an Agile iteration is. And the first thing we have to do here is look at the composition of the Agile development lifecycle. Each release to the public is a deployment that the world is able to use and work with. So the building block of that release is an iteration also known as a sprint in some forms of Agile development. So I'll use the words interchangeably in this talk. But this sprint is the heart or the key measure of forward progress for this Agile implementation. And it's a key opportunity to reevaluate what you're building and enhance it and reprioritize. So in other words, it's the key opportunity to be Agile. So iterations are about creating actionable work out of some bigger project vision. In every Agile project, there's a backlog, which is a prioritized list of features, also known as user stories. And those features are ordinarily ranked from top to bottom. So on the top, you have the most important. And on the bottom, you have the least important. Um, and what you do in an iteration is you take the top stories off the stack and you move them into the sprint. And you then break them down into their relevant tasks that are required in order to make the story uh, complete. And in order to do that, in order to make those tasks actionable, you have to do three things. The first is you have to build clarity. And this is about helping the team understand what the user story and what the task really is. Then you want to once, you understand, once the developers understand the, the, the feature, they can estimate the time associated with the task. Once we have a time estimate, we can assign ownership to a developer on the team. So now we've answered the what, the who, and the how much time, which is all that's really needed to make a task actionable. So let's look next at the agenda of an Agile Iteration Planner meeting. Now before diving into this, I have to warn you that the Sprint Planner is a complex topic and really it merits its own talk. So the bad news is that you'll have to forgive me because I'm going to go over it at a very high level and I'm going to go over it quickly. The good news, however, is that I'm going to be making a video just for the Iteration Planner and, and I'll be releasing that pretty soon. So if we simplify the Agile sort of Planner agenda, we can break it into two phases. The first is building clarity. And what we're doing here, if you look at the top left, is we're starting with the vision, which is sort of a shared understanding for the team so they have the right motivation moving forward. And this is where the product owner will describe the high-level vision of the sprint. And this vision generally depends on sort of where we are in the development cycle. So if we're at the beginning, you know, maybe we're doing things like prototyping and defining vision. If we're at the end of the cycle, we might just be debugging and focusing on performance. So we move next to the team composition. Uh, if you have a larger team, you might break it into subgroups by task or by component. Um, and again, this can change by sprint, depending on what the vision of the sprint is. Uh, and if you have a smaller team, then you don't necessarily need to break into sub-teams, and sometimes you can't because you're too small. So that's okay. Um, you move to the next piece, which is the velocity of your team. In other words, how much your team could commit to during the sprint. So you, you ask some simple questions like who's available when, you know, what percentage time allocation do people have to the project, because not every project is a full-time one. Um, and you establish sort of uh, the historical velocity of the team. So you can make your estimates based on reality and not just on theory. So we finally move to the backlog. And this is the core list of what to do during the, during the iteration. And it has to be prioritized. Clarity needs to be built. And the team needs to know sort of what's most important and what's at the top of the backlog. But the whole purpose of this first phase of the iteration planning meeting is to really build clarity, right? So it starts with that vision so everybody understands the goal. In composition and velocity, people understand they have clarity around the team structure and how much work their team is going to take on. And they have clarity around the backlog of tasks that they need to do. So if we move to the second part of the Agile Iteration Planner meeting, um, it's about building commitment, right? You want people to be committed so they're aligned and moving quickly. 
The first piece of this is airing the sort of technical concerns. This is about foresight. This is about the team foreseeing, based on their past experiences, potential roadblocks, complexities, underlying architecture changes that are associated with the tasks that they're taking on. Once the team has sort of discussed those technical concerns, they can move into the second piece of this, of the meet, of, of this phase of the meeting, which is breaking down and estimating the tasks. And you're, again, we're breaking them down into actionable tasks that can be estimated. Uh, we estimate the time and then assign the ownership during that piece. Then we reprioritize. So this is confusing for some people because we've already prioritized once in, the, in creating the backlog, um, so why do we do it again? Well, one of the core tenets of agility is that LOE, or level of effort, impacts prioritization. Generally, you have a re, you know a inverse correlation between the level of effort and the priority. In other words, if something takes a lot of effort, oftentimes it can be at the bottom of the list, and if something takes very little effort, generally the priority goes up because there's sort of a core assumption here that people want to get their features sooner. So once we've reprioritized, the team can make a final commitment and they're ready to begin the iteration. So now that the iteration is beginning, we have to look at the rules that are necessary to sort of get the iteration right. Uh, and let me just first say that we don't call it a walk. We don't call it a jog. We call it a sprint. And we call it a sprint for a reason, because the team is trying to run as fast as they can. And in order to do that, we have to create an environment by which they can go as quickly as they can. And there are a few core rules to doing that. The first is, you let developers set their own time frames. Because when you let other people, especially non-technical experts, set time frames, generally things are slower in the end. You also want to avoid interruptions. And this is the rule with sort of all knowledge work because it's heavily reliant on focus and train of thought. So you have a huge productivity loss just when somebody taps on the shoulder of a developer and interrupts them when they're in the middle of, of working on something. So you want to you avoid that and build discipline around that. And finally, similar to the second piece, is protecting tasks. Uh, this is <laughs> akin to protecting the sanity of developers, because oftentimes, uh, in an undisciplined team, priorities are changing so quickly, minute to minute, hour to hour, they're changing so fast that the developer is sort of flipped upside down. They don't know left from right. And that's a big problem for productivity and for morale. So you batch the changes and you sort of allow changes to happen in between sprints, but never during. 